Hello Antioch family and friends again. This I'm going to be looking this morning in Revelation chapter 2 again. Looking in verses 12 through 17. And the lesson is on the uh, message to the church of Pergamos. Uh, but before we want to get into the lesson this, this morning, we'll have a little word of prayer. Dear Lord, just want to thank you for all your many wonderful blessings that you've bestowed upon us. And we thank you for all that you've done for us, for Jesus dying on the cross and shedding his precious blood that we could be saved. We just want to thank you for your written word that we can study and we can learn from you, learn things about you and, and just grow in your grace and knowledge and wisdom, Lord. We just pray in this time of turmoil and trial that we're going through with this COVID-19 virus, Lord, that you just help us to endure through this and to make it through. And we know that there's that for every trial, there's a reason and a, and a, a purpose for it, that you don't do things without a reason, Lord. We just pray that you'd be with those that are sick, you'd touch them, help them to heal. Pray for those who aren't sick, they would not get sick. And just pray that we could see a timely and quick end to this pandemic that's sweeping across our land, Lord. And just pray you'd just be with our leaders, that they would have the right guidance and seek you for leadership and guidance and what to do concerning the things that we're, they're doing. And just pray you'd just lead God and direct in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning we're looking again in Revelation 2 and we're starting in verse 12 and it says, Unto the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. So as we said last week, these messages all start out identifying which church it's writing to and this is the church at Pergamos. Pergamos was also located in what is now modern day Turkey. It's actually... The ruins of Pergamos are located out of a town in modern-day Turkey called Bergama. Uh, you can actually look that up online and actually see some of the pictures of those ruins. And so it's about 100 miles north of Ephesus, about 60 miles north of Smyrna. It's 15 miles inland, so this city was not a seaport, but yet it was a city of great learning. They said that they had a library that had as many as 2,000 books in it, 200,000 books in it. And it's also in Pergamos where the art of turning animal skins into parchment was developed. So that's just a few things about that. The name Pergamos actually means fully married. And we'll kind of touch on that as we talk a little bit later about the church period that this church represents. But it says here, again, the next thing that happens is it identifies the writer who's writing to the church, and again, it's always the Lord Jesus Christ in all these cases. It's going through John, but it's Jesus that's sending the message, indicated by the fact that the words are in red in your Bible. And we see that it says here that these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. So we see here that Jesus is described as having a sharp sword that has the two edges. This was also something that John noticed in his first vision back in chapter number 1, verse 16, talks about how that out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And so we know from Paul's writings that the Word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. It is a It divides asunder and it you know, identifies what's really going on with us. And it reveals sin, it reveals the fact that we need a Savior, <clears throat> and it can bring judgment, it can bring re restoration, and that's the Word of God. So, And this particular fact that he states that describes himself in this way is relevant to later in this message. Then, as we said last week, these messages, each one has a list, goes on into a list of commendations or condemnations. In the case of this church, we again start out with some commendations, and unlike the church of Smyrna, we do have some condemnations. It says here, I know thy works, in verse number 13, and where there dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. So it says, I know thy works. 
And if you look at all the messages to each of the seven churches, he starts out in his commendation or whatever he has to say. He says, I know thy works. God is well aware of what's going on in his churches today. He's well aware of what's going on in each one of our lives. And that ought to sober, give a, be a sobering thought to us, that God is watching. God knows exactly what we're doing. He knows why we're doing what we're doing and the, whether we're doing it for the right reason or not. And so we need to realize that God is looking down and seeing what our works are. And it goes on to say, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. So we see, he says, you dwell in this place where Satan's seat's at. And Pergamos was another city, just like Smyrna, that was fully taken over to idolatry. Then the city of Smyrna, I mean, the city of Pergamos, rather, there was actually an altar or a throne in a, in a temple there. It was a 40-foot high throne to the god, god, Greek god Zeus. And so, and this word seat here literally means comes from the Greek word where we get our word throne from. So it really means where Satan's throne is. And additionally, also in Pergamos, they also worshipped the god of healing. And I probably won't pronounce this right, but it's a syphilis. And he was represented by a snake. And then actually the temple for him, they actually, people would go and lay down in the floor of this temple and allow the non-poisonous snakes that inhabited this temple to crawl over them thinking that was going to provide healing. So you can see how that this city was again totally taken to idolatry, how that Satan had a stronghold in this city and therefore God realized and, and Jesus giving this message says, you know, you're in a place where Satan's got a stronghold. And he realizes that that's a tough place to live. And again, this city just like Smyrna also was given over to Caesar worship. So they would worship Caesar as a god. And so we see the different aspects of what was going on in that city. But and then it goes on and says, <clears throat> And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even, those day, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But he gives them the commendation here, he says, But thou holdest fast my name. They've not denied the name of Jesus. It would have been easy to do so. Christianity was not looked on in a positive light during these days. It was, they, you know, they, they were given over to the pagan religions, and if you didn't worship the pagan religions, and if you did came out with a religion saying, hey, God is one God, and he's the almighty God, he's the one that created everything, and there's no need for all these other gods that you're worshiping, that, you know, that didn't sit well with the pagans. And so, and then he goes, so they goes on and says, and has not denied my faith. So they've stayed true to the faith and stayed true to the doctrines of, of the, and the truths of God's word. They've stayed true to that and in the serving of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, and it, even in the days when this Antipas here was martyred, we don't really know much about this Antipas other, Antipas other than what it says here, but we know that he was slain among you, even, and he says, eat where Satan dwelleth. So it's very likely that he stood up against the pagan religion that was going on in this city at that time and against that ungodliness that was going on and, and maybe was even murdered and slain in one of those, or near one of those Satan, one of those heathen temples that were there in the city. And then we say, go on to verse 14 now in this church we see that the Lord has some, some bad things to say about them. He says, but I have a few things against thee. Now if you go back to the church of Ephesus, we see that God, Jesus said, I have somewhat against thee. But here he says, I have a few things. So there's more than one thing that's wrong with this church at Pergamos. And he says, in ver continuing on in verse 14, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now, you've got to go back to Numbers, chapter 22 through 25, I believe it is, where we find out a little, find out about the story of Balaam. And if you're familiar, maybe the most thing you're maybe familiar with concerning Balaam is the fact that his donkey spoke to him. And 
But Balaam was a hireling prophet of Mesopotamia. Balak, the king of the Moabites, along with the Midianites, sent to Balaam to have him come and curse the children of Israel as the children of Israel coming up, heading into the Promised Land. God had already told the children of Israel that they're not going to possess any of the Moabites' land, but Balak was still very concerned about these people, afraid he was going to be wiped out off the face of the planet, and that no longer their, his land was going to be taken away from him. And so he tries to hire Balaam to come and curse the children of Israel. And Balaam you know, says, well, I can't do except what the Lord wants will allow me to do when he prays about it, and, but the Lord tells him not to go. But then they try to entice him more with even more riches and fame and fortune. And he goes back to the Lord and the Lord says, well, go on. But as he's going, that's when the angel of the Lord's in the way of trying to slay him and the donkey speaks to him when the donkey tries to save him from the angel of the Lord there that's trying to slay him in the way that the donkey could obviously see, but Balaam could not. And so we see that, you know, it was the foolishness here, Balaam. Well, he goes on, goes up there to meet with Balak, and, the, and they look over in a couple of different places, and they, he tries to curse the children of Israel, and every time he tries to curse them, it comes out being a blessing. So God doesn't allow this hireling prophet to pronounce a curse upon his chosen people. But so... We don't have the details of this actually given in the book of Numbers, but through other scriptures throughout the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, many of the writers talk about, mention Balaam, and indicate that, as it says here, which gives us the greatest detail about it, that he taught Balak how to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. So, if you can't curse them, he said, well, we're going we're gonna to convince them. To, to get to go against God and to be, create a stumbling block and to convince them to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Well, what we do know from the book of Numbers is that right after Balak tries to, per, to, to, to curse the nation of Israel, there's the incident of Baal Peor in which 24,000 Israelites were killed because they ended up g taking women of the Moabites and the Midianites and started, you know, having relations with them and eating things sacrificed to idols just as it here it talks. And so in a way, they ended up and brought a lot of destruction upon the nation of Israel through causing a stumbling block. And so ultimately what we see in the doctrine of Balaam, it's trying to join up with the world. It's trying to go after riches and the material things of this life and, and therefore compromising our spiritual life and not being what we are to be for God. And then we see in First, verse 15 it says, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now back in the church to the church at Ephesus, he said, You've got some there, you got those Nicolaitans there, but the church at Ephesus hated them just as Jesus hates them. And but he, he says here, within this church here at Pergamus, these believers have some there's some people in the church who actually hold to this doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now the Nicolaitans the term Nicolaitan literally comes down to meaning that to, to exercise control. It means to conquer the people. And what this implies is the starting of a church hierarchy where we start separating the lay people to the, and the clergy and start having those, a system of priests and bishops that rule over the people or even rule over smaller churches in the area around a larger church and we start this hierarchy of, of church system that begins to happen. And so and we see that Jesus says, I hate this because Jesus, it's level at the foot of the cross. All believers are equal in the sight of God. It doesn't matter whether you're a preacher, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, or just the re regular church member. You're equal in the sight of God. There's no big eyes or little U's in God's house, and when you start having this hierarchy and start saying that some people are more important than others, then God hates that and doesn't want anything to do with it. It's a contrary to what God intended for the church to be. And so we see in verse 16, he gives them a very, very stern warning. He says, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So he's telling them, Repent. Or else. This is an ultimatum. 
It is absolutely necessary that you repent of these doctrines and get these doctrines out of your church. And he says, I will fight against them. He's talking about those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And he says, I'm going to fight them with the sword of my mouth, with the word of God. He's going to, go there. He's going to reveal that they are what they are. They're teaching false doctrines. They're not teaching the doctrines of the word of God. And it's important that they stay true to the Word of God and the things that the Word of God says. Now, before we finish with verse 17, I'd like to talk a little bit about the fact that we said last week that each of these churches do represent a particular time period in church history. And the church at Pergamos represents the time period directly following that of Smyrna, which was the persecuted church. And what we see in the church at Pergamos, again, the name meaning fully married, we see that the marriage of church and state begins during this time period, and it roughly runs from around 13, 313 A.D. to 606 A.D. The key thing that happened that was Constantine came to power as the new Roman Caesar or emperor. And in 1313, he passed, had an edict passed, that allowed Christianity to have free exercise. And you know, that sounds like a great thing. Well, Christianity is now free to be exercised without the fear of persecution. And actually what Constantine had realized, he saw that the Christian people, you know, people who were Christians within his realm were the people who weren't causing any trouble, and it was the pagans who were causing him all the trouble and the uproar and the turmoil within his kingdom and within the empire. So, he decided that, that, and then another thing that happened was Constantine had this vision. He was out going out to war. He had this vision. He saw a glittering cross in the sky with an inscription by this conqueror upon it. And he went out and he won the battle. And so Constantine becomes more and more convinced that Christianity is what needs to be. So there are two doctrinal errors that come into play during this time. And that's the union of church and state. And the thing was, when Constantine gave the right for the church to actually, for the Christians to actually practice their religion without fear of persecution, he set himself up as the head of all religion. So we see, again, this marriage, church and state. And any time when marriage, you get a marriage of church and state, you're looking for trouble. We go back and we look through the history of all the, the, the dark ages and the times of the Spanish Inquisition and the things going on in Europe back in those days where, where people of so-called Christians were persecuting other Christians and, and killing thousands and thousands of them, being martyred for the cause of Christ because they wouldn't bow down to the, to the rule <coughs> of the Roman Catholic Church and other churches. And then we had the Reformation and some of these other churches came out and got a little reprieve from, from the Roman Catholic Church persecuting them so much, but then they turned around and indicate, started persecuting the true peop, the true Christians, those that we can trace back in our Baptist heritage all the way to the very beginning. They had many different names, and if you've ever read The Trail of Blood, you can find out many of those different names that true Christians were referred to down through the ages. But they were persecuted not only by the Roman Catholic Church now, but they're persecuted by all these other, the Lutherans and the and the others that came out of the Reformation. And so we see the problems we have there. But another one that it, era that came out of this time period was baptism or regeneration. You know, Constantine actually waited till right before his deathbed to be baptized because, but he still thought that baptism was the means of salvation. He wanted to be able to live his life and do whatever he wanted to and then just suddenly get baptized and, oh, all my sins are washed away. Our sins are not washed away by the water of baptism. Our sins are washed away by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the only way your sins can be washed away. Baptism is nothing but a symbolic act that we do when we join the church to show that we are now dead to sin and arisen again anew in Christ Jesus. So that's enough about the... Pergamus church period, but that just kind of gives you an idea of what was going on during that, that, the period that this church represents. And then we finish up with verse 17 here. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. 
and all the messages conclude in this general manner with a admonition to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We need to listen to what the Holy Spirit says. The Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, can reveal to us what the Lord wants to talk, tell us. And if we don't study the Word of God and we don't have a hearing ear to what the Holy Spirit says, we're doomed to get caught up in error and go down an incorrect path. But then it goes on and gives the promise to the overcomer. And like I said last week, the first three churches have this promise to the overcomer after the admonition to hear. When we look, start going into the next four churches, we'll see that the promise to the overcomer comes before. The significance of that, like I say, I still don't quite know, but it is an interesting little fact. He says here, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give in him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So the Lord promises here that he will give the believer that overcomes, when and what I and by overcoming, overcomes sin, is victorious, had lived victorious in, in their Christian life, they've overcome, says I'm going to give them hidden manna. Now you say, what is manna? Manna is that bread. It was this little small thing that came up in the dew that the children of Israel ate as they were in the wilderness. As one writer I was reading after said, it was like over, over 12,000 days that God provided this manna to the children of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness. At times they got to where they complained and didn't like eating this manna, but, they, but God provided for them. In the same manner, God will provide for us. He'll provide our spiritual needs. We may not always have the greatest in physical needs, just like we talked last week about the Church of Smyrna when he said you were poor, but yet you're rich. We may not have a lot of material uh, in, in far as this life as Christians, and I think today we're far more blessed to have more things than we really truly deserve, but it's those spiritual blessings that really count. And when you go back to the book of John, you find out that Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you know, your fathers ate of the manna in the wilderness. They said, I am the, the bread that comes from heaven. I am the bread of life. And it's important to realize that he is the source of all things. He's the source of our substance, spiritually. And we need to look to him and trust in him. And then additionally says, I will give him a white stone, and in that stone a new name written. So here we see this white stone. Now, first thing we'll notice about it is it's the white. White speaks of righteousness and purity. And then we see that the white stone, it was common practice in these days, white stone and a black stone would be used for casting a vote. So if you voted for something, approved of something, you would give a white stone. If you were voting against something, you would use a black stone. Sometimes they would also do this to you know, like a trial. If you got white stones, then you were acquitted. If you got black stones, then you were found guilty. Likewise, athletes, when they would perform well and, and win a competition, they would be granted a white stone, which would be used as their entrance token to get into a, a feast in their honor. And also, people who were having a feast and were inviting people to them would often give the guests a white stone. And on that white stone would often be a personalized message just for the person being invited to that feast. So what we see here is we're given a white stone. It's our invitation. Invitation to heaven. Our invitation to the marriage feast of the Lamb. And it says, talks about here that it's a name written on it that no man knoweth. Now, because it says no man knoweth, we can't really know what this name is. Some have suggested that it's the very name of Christ. Because it's by, it's by the name of Christ that men must be saved. There is no other name and that by, why, by which men must be saved. But others say that it's a new name given to each and every one of us. One day we, might, we will learn what this new name is. We will learn what this means. But right now we don't know. But the thing about a new name and in some religions, they do practice this, this where they somebody, when they convert to a religion, they will give, them, give themselves a new name to go along with that religion. The fact that they converted to that religion, and the fact that we learn in the, in the, in the New Testament and concerning our salvation, 
We're not to be the old creature we were before we're saved, but we're to be a new creature. We're to put off the old man and put on the new. So in essence, we should be like a person with a new name. We're born again. It's like we started a whole new life over. And now we should live our lives because like that. It's, it's a complete starting over. Yes, you may be saved at a young age, you may be saved in a middle age, you may be saved in an old age, but when you're saved, it's like you're starting all over in a, with a new life and a new name. That's a, about all I have. I hope you got something out of it, and hope this is a blessing to those that hear it. And again, let's just be praying that the Lord would show mercy upon us in this trying time, and that we'd see a quick and speedy end to this virus situation that's keeping us from being able to meet together in the house of God. And I look forward to the day when we can once again meet back in His house and worship together, sing praises to Him, and listen, hear Sunday school lessons taught and heard messages preached in person once again. And thank you for your attention.